Thank you, everybody. So I'm Dr. Tessa Bailey. I come from the Asia Pacific Centre for Work, Health and Safety. It's located at the McGill campus of University of South Australia. And I'm going to be talking to you about psychosocial safety climate, which is a leading indicator for worker health and productivity. So leading indicators are important because they alert us to negative trends that are likely to happen in the workplace. And that can give us a chance to be proactive and actually prevent some of those issues from arising. I've seen leading indicators used effectively for evidence-based <coughs> strategies for prevention and intervention um, in the workplace health and safety. Also to better understand exposure to hazards in the workplace. And as it's a really good way of evaluating if you do implement any activities because it'll be the first thing that you'll see change in. So when we're talking about mentally healthy workplaces, uh, the research shows there has to be initiatives and activities that focus on positive worker health and well-being, um, and looking at protecting worker psychological health in order to create a mentally healthy workplace. And a leading indicator that I came across um, when I was working was psychosocial safety climate. So this is a leading indicator for your psychosocial factors in the workplace and for worker health and well-being. So what it does, it's a 12 item scale. There's three items per each of the subscales and it looks at management commitment and priority to worker health, um, in particular stress prevention and promotion of wellbeing and also organisational communication and participation in relation to stress prevention and promotion of wellbeing. So it gauges the workers' perspectives and then we can aggregate this to the organisational or unit level and we can find that it predicts a lot of factors in the workplace related to health and productivity. So here's our very complicated statistical model um, here to impress you. It's actually extended all of the well-known work stress models um, including the demand control support model, the effort reward imbalance model, the job demands resources model and what we've been able to do is extend that work. So by measuring, hang on, that's not going to go on there. Um, by measuring these aspects here, we can actually predict what's likely to happen in relation to job demands that can impact worker health and tend to result in either good or bad health outcomes for workers. And also through psychosocial safety climate, we can predict job resources, and those are the things that you give the workers to help them to manage their demands. And that tends to impact more on workers' motivation and um, tends to result in motivational outcomes, but it also interacts. And we've been researching this climate concept for not quite 10 years, and the amount of evidence, um, it's just mounting. So we found that psychosocial safety climate is related to worker health for mental health, their physical health, sickness absence, uh, injury claims, that's both cost and duration, also to a range of workplace behaviours including worker engagement and productivity, their integrity in their workplace, bullying and harassment rates and retention including both intention to leave and turnover. So I'm going to highlight just one of uh, the projects I did when I was out in practice and looking for something that was going to focus on prevention and protection of work and mental health, I came across psychosocial safety climate. And actually there was really good resource, uh, really good research already showing that it could predict work and mental health. So things like exhaustion and burnout and anxiety. But I was interested to see if it could actually predict the psychosocial factors in the workplace, the impact on physical health because I knew they existed and I wanted to see if PSC could predict those. So what we did is we measured psychosocial safety climate and we could see that it would predict workplace demands and also bullying and harassment. That then had an impact on workers' emotional exhaustion and then we could see how emotional exhaustion would lead to symptoms for musculoskeletal disorders and it could predict compensation claims for physical injuries. We removed the mental health claims for physical injuries 12 months later, and that was controlling for people who'd had a previous physical injury claim. So I was very impressed that this climate concept um, was effective in, in measuring the factors impacting on both mental and physical health for workers. So we had this 12 item scale, we could implement it in workplaces and you get a score. But my practitioner, the practitioner in me said, okay, so I've measured this, I've got a number, what does that number mean? And I'd done risk assessments before, psychosocial risk assessments where I'd gotten numbers and I weren't sure if they were good or bad. 
So um, to try to translate the research into practice, I had a look at average scores for three states that we had data on at the time. So for workers in South Australia, New South Wales and Western Australia, and we could see average scores for this PSC scale in relation to job strain and symptoms of depression. And we could see where there was low levels of job strain and no symptoms of depression. And you want no symptoms because even workers with mild symptoms of depression are taking twice as many sick days. And we could also look at moderate rates of um, PS, uh, moderate rates of job strain and depression, and we could see regular scores for PSC. So we started creating the benchmarks. We then actually had our German colleagues um, get interested in this concept. They tested those benchmarks in their population. They actually found an additional one. Uh, additional one. So at 26, if you've got scores below that, those workers are at high risk for. Um, increases in bullying and harassment and clinical levels of depression in the long term, very high risk. So we were able to create these benchmarks and that can help guide practitioners when they take a measure to know when the numbers are good or bad. Okay, so then I was like, then you get your score. <laughs> All right, so there's problems in the workplace um, in regards to PSC, then what do you do? And when I was working, I struggled to apply the standard uh, safety hierarchy to the psychosocial hazards that I was seeing in my workplaces. So for example, with bullying and harassment, when you would go to that, um, the hierarchy, you would look at, okay, eliminate. Well, you can't always fire everybody. Um, and <laughs> substitute, you can't just keep moving them around as well. And also that doesn't necessarily address the issue. Uh, personal protective equipment, mm, bubbles, tents around people to protect them, put them in their own office, they weren't very practical solutions. And when it came to policy, to be honest, more often than not, they already existed. So we created, um, myself and my director created this hierarchy of control that we found we can apply to psychosocial hazards or to PSC directly. And um, because psychosocial factors in the workplace are a little bit more complex and a bit harder to see, it actually requires all the levels. This isn't a substitution process. This is a working down model. So you start with the policy and you identify how you're addressing your psychosocial hazards in there. Then you look at how is that being implemented through your departments, through the practices, through the procedures. What is the requirements of managers? How are they being expected and accounted for in, in enacting those policies and practices? Um, what are the elements in your job design? Um, there is a lot of understanding about demands and resources and supports in job design uh, that can impact and, and create these particular risks and hazards in the workplace. Um, for instance, it's not just about high demands, it's about reasonable demands and providing the appropriate resources and support, but there can actually be issues when there's too low demands and too high control, those people become disengaged, demotivated, and you'll see high presenteeism. And so then it comes down to the worker as well. They need to know what are their expectations and responsibilities in managing their worker health. If you're ever looking at developing an action plan, I recommend focusing on the arrows because those are the PSC subscales. So you would want to say, what is your activities in relation to management priority and management commitment? Um, if they're not there, you would want to create them. And also, where is the communication happening both down and back up? And what are examples of participation? And what are you expecting the participation to be at each of those levels um, a, a tailored to the particular psychosocial hazards in your workplace? So the research has shown us there can be many benefits to improving your psychosocial safety climate. Um, we could see a 10% increase in PSC. Then you would have less reported demands, whether or not they're actual less demands, less bullying, better resources, better engagement. It's the workers reporting this. Um, and then also, if we could eliminate low PSC from the entire working population, we'd see a significant reduction in job strain and depression. Then we started realising that that moderate zone was actually really important. Initially, we were looking at the high-risk workers, but the workers, even in those moderate ranges, were taking significant amounts of sickness absence and presenteeism was a major issue. So presenteeism is workers reporting back to us how hard and fast they are actually working compared to how hard and fast they could be working. Um, and we could also, we also matched our data to Safe Work SA's workers' compensation data. And we could see at the organisational level, if your PSC score for your organisation was around the 28, there was a 50% increase in cost for claims and a huge difference in the return to work, where it compared to the organisations that had scores 48 and above. 
So looking at a, a, a workplace, an organisation we started working with, we measured psychosocial safety climate over two time waves. We were also given their um, data on sickness, absence and mental health um, or mental injury claims, psychological injury claims. And the detailed report we gave back to the employer focused mostly on uh, groups with 10 or more participants and that's to uh, maintain um, confidentiality so individuals can't be identified. And what we were able to do is show them their rates of PSC um, at the work unit and some information was on the individual level. And then we, we've got Australian workplace barometer da data. So we've got information now on these things for every state in Australia and across Australia. So we can actually show them that, yeah, their PSC scores are below the average for their state um, and for the national comparison. So they've got more employees in those higher risk zones. We were able to identify 11 work groups that were at high risk. Um, and we were also able to show that our benchmarks and subscales could predict uh, sickness absence. And in particular, one of the subscales, management priority, was a significant predictor for psychological injury claims. And because we knew how many workers were in that organisation and we were able to get an average uh, salary cost for, an, it's a very average salary cost for the, an employee in that organisation, we could put dollar figures <clears throat> onto like the sickness absence that's due to the psychosocial factors in their psychosocial safety climate in their work environment. And rather than go through the table, we could show that if we could move the workers that were in the um, high and moderate risk into low risk PSC, we could save them a million dollars in one year, if we could do that. Uh, but this, what was important to me was that we're showing that it still allows workers to take on average six days um, leave, sickness leave, because people do get sick and taking sickness leave to recover from your illness is still important. What's an issue is when you're taking sick days due to your work environment. That's a problem. So we were able to then work with them on developing targeted uh, uh, intervention approaches for those 11 groups in particular, tailored to the particular hazards that those work groups were experiencing. Um, we also suggested an organisational approach, so looking at each of the subscales across the organisation and seeing if there were activities or better implementation of policy, clearer communication, uh, more participation. And we did recommend a focus on that management priority subscale, so looking at specific uh, training for the leaders because that was impacting a, having a significant impact on psychological injury claims. So how would an organisation go about improving their psychosocial safety climate? I've seen for every organisation a different strategy because it has to complement what's already existing, the policies, processes, the WHS procedures, that, and therefore it can be integrated into that workplace. But we will see um, often that there needs to be top management support, uh, looking for evidence-based practice, so other things that you've seen that have worked, monitoring your psych psychosocial safety climate uh, is common, Having employee involvement, as others have mentioned, is key. Considering your communication systems regarding the factors in your workplace with particular attention on prevention and promotion of wellbeing, and managing the work conditions that have the potential to be a risk or a hazard in an appropriate and reasonable manner. So steps towards implementing the PSC framework, you would start by measuring PSC. It's a 12 item scale with the four subscales. This allows you to identify work groups at risk and also assess if certain subscales are making a significant contribution. You would then come up with strategies uh, by consultation maybe with key people, uh, key workforce health and, health and safety people, representatives from HR, health and safety representatives, and consultation with the workers, and develop action plans and activities that complement your current structure and use the PSC hierarchy of control as a guide. How to get started? I would recommend you think about the needs in your organisation. You identify the people who have some expertise. Potentially, they could be trained to be able to do this kind of work themselves. Discuss that with a service provider, because what our centre really wants to do is engage with you um, substantially in the first instance, but then actually develop your organisation to maintain these systems, these procedures, these practices themselves on an, as an ongoing basis. 
So key messages, each organisation will be unique in the strategies they take to improve worker mental health. Uh, we recommend evidence-based strategies that focus on the protection of worker health and wellbeing, like psychosocial safety climate framework. Consider when external consultation and training may be required, and hopefully you'll see a wide range of benefits to your environment, your worker health, productivity, and safety outcomes. That's it.